This morning we are ending our series through the book of Galatians, where the overarching title of the series was Freedom in Christ. And um, just to recap that Paul has been using three lines of arguments throughout the letter to the Galatians. So Paul wrote the letter to the Galatians because after he planted to the church and ministered to the church in Galatia, some people came behind him or after him and they preached a different gospel. They distorted the truth of that you are free in Christ. There is no longer any need to hold on to the law or any other means to work your own salvation. It is only through faith in Christ that you are saved and therefore you can be free. And he's using three lines of argument in this letter to the churches in Galatia. Now, in chapter 1 and 2, we saw that Paul had argued from his own past history, who, who he used to be, and then, then he had an encounter with Jesus, and his life changed and was transformed through the gospel. And he was sharing from his own life experience of how the gospel changed him. And he is also reminding the Galatians, um, to church, from their experience when they came to Christ. They saw miracles, people being saved. And all these experiences were to common public knowledge. Therefore, no one could argue and say, no, but that didn't really happen because it did really happen. They know it. Paul knows it. Everyone knows it. And no one could challenge Paul on the accuracy of this history. And then we saw in chapter 3 and 4 that Paul argued from theology, or, or rather he was arguing from Scripture. And he uses both general and rabbinic exegesis interpretation of scripture to teach them and to show them in this argument paul was able to show the utter inconsistency of the judaizers scriptural position he used scripture to prove to them what they are believing is not true he showed that their teaching to contradicted the very torah which they claimed to be teaching the very law that they claimed to teach they were contradicting it and Paul showed that the promise and its fulfillment met at the cross of Christ. The promise and the fulfillment, the promise that was made to Abraham, found its fulfillment in the cross of Christ, not in the law of Moses. That's what Paul was saying. And he showed that the Abrahamic covenant foreshadowed and prepared the way for the fulfillment of this promise, that is Jesus. Now in the final two um, so chapters, so chapter 5 and 6, Paul makes his most powerful argument of all and the argument for or from results. This argument is powerful because Paul appeals to total inward moral change, a total change of the heart. If this is true, then there needs to be change. And this um, to profound change in to character Paul what happened to Paul, he's arguing, is a result from the freedom in Christ through grace by faith. Now, my prayer for you this morning is that you will get a revelation of the freedom you have in Christ. That you would know the power of the cross in your life. That you will know how God sees you. That you are free and you are made right before God because of what Jesus has done. And that you will long for a walk in this freedom. And that you will come to know the, 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 enorm the enormous reality of the grace we have in God. That nothing you could do could ever to take away this free gift because Jesus paid it. And also on the other hand that nothing you could do would earn you this grace. It is only through faith. And I'm praying that this knowledge will bring you to change. Because this is a message of freedom and grace. And we find two sides of this grace when it is used or misused. On the one side of it, you find legalism. That's the far side of grace, is that legalism. Everything should be legalism. Like, it's, it's all about what you can do to earn something. It's about rules. And the other side is liberalism. That we are so liberal that we actually abuse grace. 
And Paul brings it into the balance and says, no, 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 no. That's not how it works. So I want us to go to Galatians chapter 6, verse 1 to 10. Last week we dealt with freedom, the freedom we have in Christ. And just to quickly recap while you are paging to Galatians 6, is that Paul was saying that if you are free, then you will live in the spirit. But if you are not free, you will be focused on the flesh. But Christ has set you free, so therefore walk and focus on the things in the spirit. And he says in Galatians 5, 16, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, to keep you from doing the things you want to do. And Paul moves on in this freedom to say that if you are free and living in the Spirit, there will be fruit of the Spirit. But if you are not and you focus on the flesh, there will be fruit of the flesh. And now he goes on to chapter 6. Verse 1, and the, and the title for this morning's sermon is Practical Advice for Walking in the Spirit. Because now Paul is giving them practical advice and how do we live out this reality that we are free in Christ? How do we walk in the Spirit? Because if we are free, we have the Spirit. And if we have the, and if we have the Spirit, we need to live in the Spirit. Focus on Christ. And he goes on and we can read from verse 1 to 10. Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he is something, when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one taste his own work, and then his reason to boast will be in himself alone and not in his neighbor. For each will have to bear his own load. One who is taught the word must share all good things with the one who teaches. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will, that will he also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will reap from the flesh corruption. But the one who sows to the spirit will from the spirit reap eternal life. And let us not grow weary of doing good. For in due season we will reap. If we do not give up, so then we, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially those who are of the household of faith. Paul is giving very clear practical advice in how do we live out, how do we live in the spirit, that we are set free, and now that we are focused on Christ and no longer on the flesh, how should we live? And Paul addresses two main ideas Mutual accountability and personal responsibility. Mutual uh, accountability means that we are sharing one another's burdens, but personal responsibility means that I still have to go home and live a godly life before Christ. So let us go and unpack these loaded 10 verses and speak on them. And I'll go by them sentence by sentence and some verse by verse. So. Let us pray. Father, I pray in the mighty name of Jesus that you will open our hearts and our minds for the message that you are sharing this morning. May we be focused on Christ and formed to be more like you. And I pray in the mighty name of Jesus that you will transform us in this freedom and in this grace that we have because of our faith in your son Jesus. Amen. Amen. So he's saying, brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression... You who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. And right off the bat, Paul is addressing something in the community. Because remember these Judaizers, they came in and they crept in and they, and they distorted the gospel message. The implication of that distortion would be that they lived amongst one another ungodly, most likely. That when a brother would fall in sin, there would be blame and there would be you sin, so you are no longer part of us. But Paul is saying the opposite. Because if we are focused on Christ and my brother falls, I would want to lift him up and point him back to Christ. 
Last week we had the comrades, and I don't know if you who watch the comrades, V had the comrades up in the house because she likes watching, watching people run. Um, God bless her for that. But it was at the, at the at that last 20 minutes of the marathon of the circumference. Sorry, after 11 hours and 40 minutes had had passed. Some people have been running for that long to complete the race. They have 12 hours. The moment that whistle blow, the race is over. Even if you are one meter away from the finishing line, you missed it, sorry. And it is so heartbreaking to see in the last few minutes the people that come in. There was one guy that whistle was probably five seconds from blowing. You saw this guy crawling on the floor just to reach that finish line. He crawled. He was like crawling over the line and he made it just seconds to spare. But the heartbreaking part is when you see some, they come around to the corner, then there's that last, I think, a few meters. When they see that finish line, their legs just give in. There was one lady, it was so sad to watch. She came around that corner and she ran and she collapsed. She tried to get up, she fell. Later she was just sitting there and people running past her. Just people running past it, so focused on their own race that they don't even stop and consider this lady. Now there's a rule in so the comrades, the, 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 the officials cannot help the person if they fell. But I, I believe I could be wrong that those who run can help, but only to, to some degree. And only few people stopped and tried to help this lady. And it was so sad that she couldn't even get up, so people just left her there. And there was one guy, when he came around that corner and he saw that finishing line, he wobbled. He like wobbled and he held on to the side of the fence and he wobbled his way to the end. But what, what is so beautiful is to see those, those moments where people help one another cross the line. And I think something about that is bearing, it is that when our brother or someone in the church is caught in any transgression, fell into sin, how do we restore that brother? What is our attitude towards those who maybe do not get it yet? They are still trying. I mean, Christianity is so new to them. They are like stumbling to the finishing line. Or maybe their legs give in completely. And Paul is saying that you who are spiritual, you who have, a, you who have the Holy Spirit in you, you who are a child of Christ, you who belong to to Abraham's people, which is God's people, because you have the Holy Spirit in you, and the Holy Spirit crying out, Our Father, as we saw in the previous chapters. You who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. And I think sometimes we can be so fixed on the flesh. So Paul is exposing the focus on the flesh, because if your focus is on the flesh, you will look down on your brother that falls. But if your focus is on Christ and you are looking to Christ and your brother falls, where, what would your response be? Your response would be, brother, you've fallen. God has a plan for your life. He has not given up on you. Come on, stand up. Let's cross that finishing line together. That would be our heart. And I'm thinking back to what the, the parable that Jesus shared about the Good Samaritan. We all know that parable, so I'm not going to reread the whole parable, but I am going to speak through the parable. There was a, um, as the parable go, there was a Jew next to the road. He was robbed. He was beaten. Now, a religious person, supposedly a priest and a Levite, passed this guy that was robbed and beaten, left next to the side of the road, presumably a Jew. They just walked past the one who has experienced wrong happening to him. They just walked past and it goes on that a Samaritan, now if you know anything about Samaritans and Jews, they are natural enemies. Their hate towards one another went beyond hate. A Samaritan seeing a Jew next to the road dying would be good. Let's leave him there. He got what he deserved. That's the attitude what Samaritans and the Jews had with one another. Hate is not a strong enough word for the feelings that they had towards one another. But the Samaritan 
saw this person next to the road who was a Jew and cared so much about the restoration of someone that was fallen that he um, t- um, t- took it on himself to get that person the help he needs. Now, most of us would go, okay, I've dropped this guy off at the hospital. My, my, my debt towards him has been paid. I have put him in a position where he could possibly get the help that he would need. But no, this guy went above and beyond and he said, here is some money. Please see to it that he gets the help he needs. By the way, should he need more than I've paid, charge it to my account. Because when I come back, I will settle it. The absolute love to someone who has fallen. And that foreshadows the absolute love that Christ has for us, number one. That he goes beyond paying our debt so that we could be restored to to be who he called us to be. And secondly, that also tells us our response to one another. That our love for one another should be infinitely greater than that what could possibly divide us because Christ paid the price on the cross. So if my focus is on the flesh and I hear or see my brother fall, my response would be, yeah, no, I, I, I knew that guy was not serious about God or say unspeakable things. Who knows what's going on in that person's relationship with God? Maybe the temptation that day got too much. Maybe they were so in a bad space that they fell doesn't mean that they have a bad or worse relationship with God than you. It just means that maybe their focus shifted a bit from Christ onto fleshly things and they fell. What should our response be? If my focus is on Christ, my, my, my first thought ought to be, how can I restore my brother to get back to Christ? But we are in a society that is so judgmental, so focused on the flesh. And Paul is saying, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Not, oh, how dare you fall into sin. You never really loved God. No. In a spirit of gentleness means you pick him up. You affirm him in who he is in Christ. That Christ died for him and that God has not given up on his life. So he can dust himself off, look at the cross and continue his race with patience and endurance. That is what he's saying. That if we are not spiritual and we are focused on the flesh, we will look at all the reasons not to restore our brother. But he's saying that you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. That that gives a responsibility to us to say that when a brother falls, we pick him up and we restore him and we continue the race. And then he goes on in in the second sentence of verse 1. He says, keep watch on yourself lest you too be tempted. Knowing that none of us can stand ever and say, I am beyond temptation. The moment you say, I am beyond temptation, guess what? Your focus is on the flesh and what happened to your brother will happen to you. Because it is a matter of perspective that if my focus is on Christ, that's all that matters. And if my focus is on Christ, I don't care why my brother fell. I care that he should stand up, be restored in the spirit of gentleness, and that he can get to Christ. Because I know very well that I'm maybe one temptation too many away from falling myself. That I am maybe one situation away from compromising my own values. Because if it could happen to my brother, it could surely happen to me. We should not be so self-righteous that we think we can never fall. I've seen what happened to what happened to people who think that way. I've seen what happened to people who think that they are above spiritual accountability. Because I am holy, I am saved by Christ, so I don't need any accountability. I can just go on with life and Paul's very argument in in chapter 1 says, Paul, an apostle appointed by God, not by man. This gospel that I'm preaching to you is not man's gospel, it's God's gospel that I received through a revelation of Jesus Christ. He still went to the church and spoke to those who seemed influential. And when they most likely compared versions of their gospel, they realized, well, okay, well, we are preaching the same gospel. And Paul goes on in chapter 
2 and he says that, and they saw that God's hand is with me to preach the gospel to the Gentiles, the same as God was with Peter to preach the gospel to the circumcised, the Jews. And they gave their right hand of fellowship to me. So we should never think that we are above accountability, above falling. And when someone we know fall or fell, we need to be so focused on Christ that the first response is, my brother, what can I do to restore you? If you lock yourself in the house, I'm going to break that wall down because I want you to get to where God is leading you. I don't want you to stay behind. And, and then in verse 2, he says, Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. What is the law of Christ? Jesus, when they asked him, what, when they asked him, what are the laws that should, we should follow? Give us it. And, and Jesus' response was, Love the Lord your God with all your body, your mind, and your soul. And love your neighbor as yourself. And Paul writes it in 5 verse 14, For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And I'm saying, bear one another's burdens. If there's a brother or a fellow believer in the house who has a burden, I should be coming alongside them and sharing in that burden, helping him them carry the load. Because that is to fulfill the law of Christ. To love my neighbor as I love myself. Meaning I would help you the way I would want someone to help me when I'm going through something or have gone through something. But remember in, the, in, in a, to the, to the beginning I said Paul is addressing mutual accountability and personal responsibility. And I'm going to make it practical just now. And, and then verse 3 plays into the same attitude. For if anyone thinks he is something, when he is nothing, he deceives himself. What is the attitude we have nowadays? Me, myself, and I. I don't need to open up. I don't need to share my burdens with anyone. I'll do it on myself. I'll do it by myself. I'll survive. No one has ever been there for me before, so I don't need anyone moving forward. You are deceiving yourself because you think... You are something when you are nothing. It speaks to those people who do not want to open up to rely on others. But it also speaks on the attitude of some things who goes on and you say, oh, there's, there's, there's nothing wrong with me. There's no fault. There's no issues. There's no sins. There's no, no nothing that I can struggle through. I, I just don't need help because I'm just not that person. You are deceiving yourself. We are made for community. We are saved into a community of believers. And Paul says, if anyone thinks he is something, when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one test his own work, and then his reason to boast will be in himself alone, and not in his neighbor. For each will have to bear his own load. Let me make it practical. All... If we bear one another's burdens in the church, let's say all the married men of GBC, we speak and we say marriage is not that great. And we share with one another the burden of marriage. And we encourage one another in the Lord to serve at home because God has called us to be husbands and wives, husbands to our wives in the way Jesus laid himself down to the church. So now we encourage one another. We are having mutual accountability. It's still up to me to go home and do it. There's mutual accountability and personal responsibility that we can encourage one another. We can carry one another's burdens until kingdom comes, but we still have to go home and do the work. We still stand before God and say, and we have to say, and we are responsible for what we do before God. Yes, we can be in, in a group and we can share our struggles and we should do that. We definitely should do that. But when we stand before God, I cannot say to God, no, my group of guys that I speak to, they've conquered this. No, but what about you? 
I still have to go home and do the work. Sharing the burden with, with one another lightens the load and it brings great encouragement so that when we go home or when we move away from there, we do the work because we are responsible for what our response to the gospel. We can all be in church, we can all worship God and we can all learn all the good things about the gospel, about the word of God, how Jesus has set us free. But if we don't go out and live it, it's a personal responsibility. There are mutual accountabilities that we come together and we learn and we grow in our relationship with Christ. But Monday I still need to go to work and I still need to live out my relationship with God. Mutual accountability and personal responsibility. That we share one another's burdens. That if I know a brother is struggling and he's opening up, I'm there to carry his burden. Because who knows, maybe tomorrow I'm in need. And then I'll open up and say, guys, I'm really battling. Will you guys pray with me? Will you guys help me with this burden? But I still have to go and do the work. Make sense? And then he goes on and he says this thing about mutual uh, accountability. Bearing one another's burdens, he's speaking in light of that because he is addressing things in the church that were not okay. He was addressing in the church that people who fell into sin were not being restored in the spirit of grace. He's addressing things in the church where people were not bearing one another's burdens. And if you don't take personal responsibility, you are always going to go to a place of needing help, but never going to a place of applying the help you receive. And you'll just go back and back and back. Where is the gospel change in that? There's no change. So then he goes on in verse 16, he says, One who is taught the word must share all good things with the one who teaches. Plainly put, Paul is saying, pay your preacher, pay your teacher, pay the one who is sharing the things of the word of God with you. That is what Paul's saying to the church because they were not doing it. And the thing of bearing one another's burdens if is the one that teaches and preaches the word is, is um, sharing in the burden of, the, of, the, of those listening. He is sharing the burden for their need of spiritual food, of spiritual sustenance of teaching and preaching the word so that they could grow and learn about the freedom they have in Christ and so on the other side those hearing should share in the burden of the financial that that someone who dedicates himself to to teach the word would be taken care of so it's one one person sharing the burden of another and vice versa that is what Paul was saying and in the church Let's apply it to modern day because um, it is saying that the church exists so that people can come to Christ, be so taught the word of God, be preached the word of God so that they can grow into the calling that God called them to. The, the church is carrying the burden of those who are in spiritual need. But then on the other side, those who are receiving spiritual or have their spiritual needs met should carry the burden of the church to be able to do it. Now, there are few areas of abuse, um, which is why, as a church, we don't um, preach on giving at the moment. But if I love you enough to share with you the word of God and that you are free and that you can grow in your relationship with God and that we should carry one another's burdens, I should love you enough to give you the full gospel. Paul is not shying away from giving them the full gospel. Neither should we who preach the word of God. That we don't, because of the abuse of others, we generally don't share much on it. But it does create a culture that some might think there is some revenue coming in is not. Everything we have in this building is because of those who faithfully tithe. The so coffee we can drink, the, 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 the venue we can have, everything that enables ministry in GBC is because of those who give faithfully. There's no other stream that comes in than those who give faithfully. Everything we have is because of those. And thank you to those who do give faithfully, that enables us as a church to carry on the mission that God gave, to go and make disciples so that Jesus can be made known and lives be transformed and people be saved. 
But the one side of abuse is a, a preacher has, has no right to demand anything. And I, um, generally, in, generally churches work like this. That those who are in full-time ministry, there's a, um, what we call a board that decides the pastor gets the salary. Boom. And then what that pastor does with that salary, that's his salary. If he decides to go buy a nice suit, there's obviously limits to the suit. It should not cost a fortune. But let's say a the pastor gets a salary and he decides, well, you know what? The clothes I have are not nice. Let me dress nice for a Sunday so that I could better serve the people. Now someone with the wrong heart in the church sees the pastor. Now the pastor is wearing a nice suit. Oh, what is he doing with my money? That's a wrong heart. And some people do think that way. They think that they now own the church or the pastor when they tithe or when they give. That's a wrong heart. And on the other side, it should not be abused from the church's side, but also it should not be abused from the giver's side. And from so the giver's side, I've heard so many times that when someone gives, now they have a say. Now they come in and they say, well, we need to change the curtains, we need to change the trees. No, 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 no. Rather take back what you've given because you're not giving it with the right heart. So there's abuse both ways that should be addressed. The other form of abuse is to just not give. Imagine if the, the, the church would one Sunday just not open because why? If, so the church responded sometimes to the heart that some people have. We might go to church on a Sunday and then they're just the doors closed. Oh, so sorry, there's no church today. But we don't do that because we share one another's burdens. And the church exists to advance the kingdom of God. And those who, who are receiving spiritual growth should then help carry the burden of the church to carry on its mission. And it is good stewardship to give where you are being fed. You would not go to the store and, and um, have some fruits and drink and then you just walk out. No, you pay where you receive. And that's, I'm not saying you should, you should, you should pay your church. I'm just saying Paul is directly saying, Give to the one that teaches you the word of the gospel. I'm just addressing the misunderstandings and the abuse of both sides. Uh, and I'm praying that, to God that I'm carrying over the message. So let's move on. With that being said, we will at some point do a good sermon on finances because I want you to grow in obedience and what God is calling you to. This is simple obedience, what Paul is speaking of. When a brother has fallen, restore him. And don't think you cannot fall yourself. Paul is saying, carry one another's burdens. And don't deceive yourself to think that you don't have a burden that needs to be carried. We get so thick-skinned because men don't cry. That we don't share our burdens and we should share our burdens. And on the other side, on, on the things of giving to the church, it's an obedience thing. It's a responsibility. And then he goes on to verse 7. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he reap. So Paul is now saying, what you give, you will receive. And then he goes on to explain what he's saying. And he says in verse 8. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. That if your focus is on, this, on the flesh, you will not restore your brother. If your focus is on the flesh, you will not carry one another's burdens. If your focus is on the flesh, your attitude towards the church will be in the flesh. And you will receive a fleshly reward. And what is Paul speaking of? Because Paul didn't change his thought since to chapter 5. Where he said in verse 5, verse 19, Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. If your focus is on the flesh, the result will be the flesh. And then he goes on and he says, But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. If our focus is on the Spirit, we will restore our brothers. 
we will carry one another's burdens and we will share all good things. And then he goes, uh, sorry, who sows through the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. Now that reaping is both in the now and the life to come. In the life to come, we know it's, it's a eternal life for those who put their faith in Christ. But in the now, we reap the spiritual reward that is now, which is fruit of the Spirit. Joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And he says, let us not grow weary of doing good. For in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So then... As we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone and especially those who are of the household of faith. Paul is addressing so many things in these few chapters. But it comes down to two main thoughts. It comes down to restoring those who have fallen and sharing one another's burdens. And the, implica- and the implications of sharing one another's burdens goes into full extent of the gospel. That we live out the gospel amongst one another. That we go out and live out the gospel amongst those who have fallen and those who are in need. Both being a, a spiritual consumer, receiving from one another, receiving but also giving back. Being there for one another, restoring one another. Because that is what makes up so the church. is people that are so transformed by the gospel that their lives are being changed, that it flows out to one another. That if I'm growing in my love for God and I'm growing in my relationship with God, then it should have an outflow amongst other people. And I think we have so many attitudes and Paul is addressing the heart. And he's saying, brothers, to the whole church of Sikilajia, he's saying, I'm Paul. An apostle, because God appointed me to, to be an apostle. And I have brought you a message of freedom. That if you believe in Jesus Christ, you are free. You don't have to follow false things or the law because it has been fulfilled. You only need Jesus. And the day you accept Jesus into your heart, you become a son of God. The Holy Spirit comes inside of you and your heart can cry, Abba, Father, meaning you belong. God is your Father because of what Jesus has done. And he goes on to say that you are now free. Just don't use your freedom. Don't abuse your freedom. There comes a responsibility with this freedom. With great freedom comes great responsibility. Because it is not freedom that we've earned. It's not freedom that we work for. It's not freedom we can lose. But our response to this freedom is what matters. Are we going to continue focusing on the flesh? Are we going to continue to promote the things that are not of the Spirit? Or are we going to be focused on the Spirit? That we grow in our love for God and live out that love amongst one another. And I don't know if you've ever heard of a guy named Dietrich Bonhoeffer man he he was a theologian in the 1930s before a a german theologian in the 1930s when hitler came into power he wrote directly against what hitler was doing he loved people so much that he didn't care what the consequence would be he was invited to go to america and he continued writing against what hitler is doing then he went back to germany in the midst of Hitler's uprising and they formed a secret Bible college where he taught. Eventually he was brought into a concentration camp and there he learned to live in community. That the foundation of the love we have for one another, the mutual responsibility, the, the application of Galatians 6, the mutual accountability and the personal responsibility just grew inside of him so much but he refused to speak the truth he was later banned by hitler's organization or team or whatever to no longer write christian material until he was hanged he never gave up because love for others driven him 
And for Paul, he was stoned and beaten. His love for others to know Christ truly is what kept him going. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Jesus persevered to the very end because he loves you and he wants you to be restored back to the Father. And then the question is, will you allow that love to transform you? That you will restore your brother. That you will carry one another's burdens. And so live out the freedom and the love that God has for you. Man, how do we treat people sometimes? And my prayer for you is that you will grow in the love of God. That your focus will be Christ and nothing else. And I'm praying as Paul prayed, until Christ is formed in you. That is my prayer for you. You are free. With that freedom you can become who God has called you to be, that you can serve Him and obey Him. Let us pray. Father, I thank you in the mighty name of Jesus, Father, that we can be changed and transformed and no longer be who we used to be. That we are being made into a new creation because Jesus of what you are doing in us. Father, and I just pray that you will come and take our heart of flesh and our focus on the flesh and remove it. you will come and put your spirit in us and that we learn to walk in the spirit with our eyes fixed on you carrying one another's burdens and so fulfilling the law of Christ that we love one another in the mighty name of Jesus I pray Amen and Amen It is a, one thing that is interesting that when it comes to the thought of leadership because you can use the bible to affirm any view of leadership you want to have it's there you can you can misuse it but when we go to the gospels and we look at matthew mark luke and john and we ask this question about leadership and we look at jesus and we see how he led his disciples he washed their feet and he said, if any of you wish to be great, let him serve one another. That absolute servanthood. And I'm praying may that be formed in you. Amen.